and we are live again for the Talking with Francesco series. This is the episode 212. Welcome everyone. Make some noise in the chat. Hi everyone. Hi Lyrical. Hi Vijay. Web Webcash. <laughs> I love this nickname. And uh, so many other people. Let's go. Let's go. And I think uh, we can start. So I've been waiting for this for, for a while because uh, uh, I think that me and Dave started almost together on YouTube. Now, he's already beyond uh, 250,000 subscribers, so he did something good there. But I really wanted to have a coffee chat with him. So I said, why don't we make it public so we can enjoy? You can also ask questions to him. So, Dave, Gray, please introduce yourself. Uh, it's a honor to have you here on this uh, podcast. Hey, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Francesco. Um, my name is Dave Gray. Uh, you might be familiar with me. I teach uh, web dev and uh, programming tutorials on YouTube, which has primarily been my focus. I mean, I, I could learn so much from you, Francisco, because you're on so many different uh, platforms and you're doing well on all of them, including YouTube. I've seen the growth. Uh, but I have focused there and uh, I teach beginners primarily, although I do cover some advanced topics. And that's because I've been a university instructor for about a decade. And I, I do that as an adjunct. I'm not a full-time university instructor, although I was for about three years before I went into the private sector to uh, work as a developer. So the university stayed in touch with me and asked me to continue to teach uh, at least one course online each semester. So I do that as well. Very, very interesting because I also have, I have a past as a teacher. Also, both of my parents are teachers. So I, I can see, I can see like uh, some analogies already. So Dave, please uh, tell me something about like the initial part. Like uh, how did you get into tech? How did you get into development? You said about university, but like, I don't know, maybe earlier. Like, yes, early, was, like, uh, early. I was uh, writing HTML before anybody was using CSS. So early on, when I, when I was a student and a grad student on campus, in the mid to late 90s, I've been around for a while. So I got involved in the first dot boom and I started my own company in 1999, which I sold in 2005. And in that time, I was, uh, of course, creating a, a web page based on e-commerce with HTML and applied some CSS. I was using mostly HTML at the time. So something completely different than we do now. So about the time I sold that company was about the time Gmail was getting started. And we saw the first signs of Ajax there, the asynchronous JavaScript and XML, which we were not applying before that time. We were just delivering static pages. And of course, as, as we start to talk about uh, modern frameworks and what's happening now in the field, uh, we're getting back to that static content, which I think is a good thing. And there's reasons behind it that I can see from way back when, because we needed that static content then to rank well in the search engines too. Yeah, it seems like like now we are discovering something new, but this has been around for a while. It, it, it's like a circle, no, it's like fashion, yes. I think. Like things are coming after 30 years to say, oh, this is so new. <laughs> Usually it's uh, it's not. And by the way, there are so many compliments that it would be hard to highlight them all. By the way, Node.js video is amazing. JavaScript, TypeScript videos. I see so many one video one video things like uh, crash courses uh, i see many different topics and nestjs uh, express html css so many let's say beginner level but uh, maybe it's even harder like to make this uh, beginner level uh, beginner friendly videos and so yes amazing it's a kind of reminder that if you want, you can drop your questions about uh, Dave whenever you want. Uh, we do, we, I want to dive deep into two topics. The first one is about content creation because he's an amazing content creator. I want to know more about YouTube, so I'll use this uh, podcast and I'll use about this uh, to ask a couple of things. And then we'll get into the main topic, which is a roadmap for web development in 2024. So super interesting. So start dropping your questions now. Dave, I want to ask you something about uh, your journey, especially on YouTube, but also like as a content creator in general, like something about it you might think that uh, might be useful even even uh, for me or someone who maybe you want to get started into 
YouTube and video creation. So something about your your path uh, on YouTube. How how has it been? Oh, well, thanks for asking. Uh, really, I started out creating videos for my university students is, is what I was primarily creating those for. And I thought, why not open this up? for everyone. I'm putting it on YouTube. It was the middle of the pandemic. I believe July of 2020 is when I started. And I thought, well, let's just offer this to everyone. And, and there was some interest there. And so it just kind of grew from there. The, as I created content, uh, for the most part, and here I've just kind of committed recently to putting my face in, a, in the circle or whatever you do in a, in a video to share those expressions, because I do think it helps communication some. But Primarily for the last several years now, I haven't done that. And the reason is I've just been focused on the topics and the education, not, not so much uh, trying to make a video look cool or you know some, some great quality. I do things that I want to see in a video myself, like I zoom in and increase the font. I don't like to watch videos where I'm struggling to, to see what uh, what's on the screen, what what they're typing. And and I'm a little older and wear contacts, so there's part, part of that too. But I always think, uh, what does a student need? And, and my driving motivation uh, every day, every year, the, the thing underneath is I, I'm saying, be the person you needed when you were younger. What what would a beginner need? What, what could I do to help the student? I think if you're motivated by that, you really can't go wrong. You may not create the best video or even the fastest video. I don't do much of that learn X and Y minutes type of thing. Uh, and some say I speak slowly or uh, too slow, but others love the detail. And I go into the why I'm doing this as well. So it's maybe it's a different approach, but it's probably more uh, from my background as an instructor and working with beginners every semester as I have. So I, I approach it from that method, I guess, or that place. What what does a student need? And and some would call this uh, creating with empathy. I guess that that's part of it is is saying, what did I need when I was younger, when I was starting out? So if I can always put myself back in that place, and I think you'll find as you grow, and as I said, you're growing on YouTube, it becomes more difficult, harder and harder to answer every question. So. I'll say this now, I apologize uh, because I wish I could answer every question, but I am often overwhelmed with comments and direct messages. And uh, at about 100,000 subscribers, I had to start kind of setting some of that aside. There's just no way to keep up with, with all of that. So I do the best I can, but when I get a question or comment on a video that I created two and a half years ago or two years ago, I honestly don't remember. I would have to go back and watch that section myself too. So I still have the empathy there and I can answer questions in general. I don't have the time to go back and, and hit every question <laughs> in every detail. And I certainly don't remember every video. At this point, I have, I, I think, over 300, maybe approaching 400. So it, it's it's hard to do everything that you that you want to do or wish you could do to help beginners. But I do what I can. I I can feel I can feel you so much, and I think <laughs> that uh, on one side we would like to help everyone because maybe we made a video, maybe we know at least that we were what we were talking about maybe a couple of years ago, maybe we have an idea. On the other side, uh, it's very hard, and I think that uh, if you leave a company, you should understand that uh, we are we are not AI bots, but we are human <laughs> beings with some especially problems, issues, lives, maybe families. So yes, but the, the the fact that you we are here saying about this, it's a, it's already too much. I think so. It's uh, it's uh, something. I think it's a part of content creation. I remember me on Twitter. Until 5,000 uh, followers, I was replying to everyone, uh, trying to give us an answer. Now it's impossible. Like I receive like 500 DMs per day. Some people get mad, like, why didn't you reply me? Sometimes I can't even reply to <laughs> my, my mom. Or sometimes it's even hard <laughs> to reply to my family. So well, you better like, reply to your mom. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I, I will, I will, I will. But that's why, but I like the, the concept of, or for example, or at least the, leaving a comment so you make it public i don't know if it ever happened to you but sometimes maybe i'm sleeping <laughs> because i maybe i'm another side of the globe maybe someone else come and they reply to to, to someone in the in the comments so and that, that's amazing i always say great thank you when uh, when this happens this is a great uh, 
great things. So sometimes it happens. Not every time, but sometimes it happens. That there are some angels, you know, that they go on YouTube channels or they fly into other comments. That's uh, <laughs> we should make a, a group just to cheer for them. Nice, nice. We have many questions, so I would like to keep to take a couple of them. And then I want to step into this uh, main topic, which is about a roadmap for web development. But I really like this question by Madhu. Hey, Madhu. How to think as a content creator, as a web developer? Because content creator can be anything, but like specifically, if you're a web developer and you have want to think as a content creator. So maybe the question might be like, uh, how can you build the mindset of the content creator? Oh, wow. Um... I think you might be able to give me some tips on that, Francisco. <laughs> uh, as a content creator for me, and again, I've primarily focused on YouTube instead of any other platform, but I, I've created tutorials or lessons because in the past I've had to plan out lessons even by semester, so 16 weeks at a time on uh, lessons that I would teach to a class of students, whether that's online or when I was on campus in the classroom. and so. That has been my my driving thing is to create those lessons about a, a specific topic. Now, uh, and again, as we get into the roadmap, I, I can talk about different foundations that I think are important. And when I create more advanced courses, uh, things that come after those initial foundations, and I believe if, if anyone's watching that has watched some of my videos, they'll know that I list prerequisites. And that's something we do on campus too, before you take a class you list out the prerequisites, like you should have this prior knowledge, you know, you should have learned vanilla JavaScript before diving into this framework that uses JavaScript, for example. I agree, I agree. And for me, the for me, the, the, the secret of building a mindset of content creator is not, don't make it too complicated. Start small from what you know, and then you expand. So, and, mm -hmm. uh, and these, uh, doesn't have to like you don't have to start creating content after three four years and I, i've done exactly this mistake like i waited for too many years because uh, for me doing these sort of things it was absolutely like impossible let's say <laughs> i was too shy let's say to do this and now i'm absolutely shameless but, uh, <laughs> that's it so i will build this uh, mindset of the content creator my now everything i do I can think that this can be turned into content, even something that I learned just yesterday, just last week. So it's more about a mindset. It's like, it's the difference between someone who's traveling and someone who's traveling and also doing a travel vlog. So they, they both travel. The travel mm -hmm. blogger does that extra step to also document what they are doing, which is very, it's, it's high effort because maybe you want to enjoy your trip, you want to, maybe you want to just to code. If you do that extra step of creating content, you will get the, of course, some benefit. Already and uh, I, I can just piggyback on that to say that uh, when you teach others, I think it creates a deeper understanding for yourself too. So for me, there's a little bit of selfishness in there too, because it, it helps me to go back over the basics of HTML and CSS, things that maybe I've known for a long time, but diving back in, it, it helps create a deeper understanding. So there, there's also that. And as you said, there's different types of content creation and channels as well. So even in, in coding and programming, there's different types of channels out there. So I really like the content you share uh, because you're educating as well. And that's also what I'm trying to do. I focus on education. I'm not into what they would call edutainment. I'm, I'm not providing hot takes or doing any drama. I, I'm not interested in any of that. There are channels that do that. And I think it creates a uh, you know, a lot of subscribers fast. I think it creates a a lot of views quickly if that's what you're going after. But I see those channels often burn out as well. I, I don't think it's easy to keep those going. Where if, if I'm teaching a lesson or creating a series of tutorials, uh, that's that's what it's all about for me is education. I'm, I'm not saying anything bad about those other channels, by the way. I'm just saying that's not for me. That's That's not my driving motivation. I, I I agree. So I made, I think, all the possible type of videos. I made uh, crazy videos, uh, uh, super educational videos, live videos, long, I made all the types of videos. I made like 700 on YouTube and 2000, I don't know, thousands on Twitter. And I can, at some point, like two months ago, I decided, okay, let's just uh, churn like what's not working. So what is working the best for me? 
technical education account. Perfect. Let's go with them. I mean, they are not like 100% boring. If I can find a, a one joke from time to time, it's even good to, to get the attention. I get what you say, and I think it's not for everyone. So, but I mean, again, not uh, throwing shit as to who is doing it. Oh yeah, absolutely. If it, if you can keep your mental mental health and stability, go for that. <laughs> Oh, everyone um, has their own style for sure. I'm glad you found yours yeah. because look at that current growth you're having on YouTube. Look at that. That's, that's you great. See, I'm doing exactly what what I've been doing in the last two months. Like on the Wednesday, I have a podcast. <laughs> on the Saturday, I have a live stream. I'm doing with this uh, <laughs> winning team, I would say. And, and yes. I'll, I'll give you a plug right here. If anybody that typically watches my channel is watching, they need to follow Francisco here because he'll teach you about Docker. He'll teach you about Rust. He's got great topics that I have not covered. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That's uh, You're making me blush. And uh, <laughs> see, I see that you are doing amazing videos. So I want to check uh, some of them. Uh, I like, the, for example, this format of the crash course. Uh, and he really doesn't need my shout out, but uh, go check his channel as we see the chat that it's really going crazy, full of compliments. So it's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you so much, Dave. Nice. So I think we, we are ready now to get into the main topic. So we see many questions. So the idea is to have a roadmap for web development. So from, from where do we want to start? Because it seems maybe easy, but uh, what do you think it's uh, the right way to start? Uh, maybe we can even try for absolutely beginners. And then maybe, I don't know, let's try to please everyone. Something super hard usually in one video, but... Uh, that, that's a great place to start is for absolute start. beginners. Pardon let's me start. while I take a quick drink here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm trying to get all the questions. So, okay, so I'm starting all the questions. So we'll start, we'll try to answer them all. So many questions, perfect. Nice. Okay, perfect. Dave, let's start with the roadmap. And by the way, there is a, a, a video, of course, on this, uh, on his YouTube channel. I'll try to find it uh, while, we are, while we are speaking, yeah. Sure. Um, so yeah, I have a YouTube short, right, as you visit my channel for the first time. That, it's a web dev roadmap in one minute, essentially. So I'll give that high level view here first. And this is what we do on the university campus as well. Um, the very first thing you should learn is HTML. And, and we group that into a 16-week course that includes CSS also, which can be a bit of a crash course. Now, I'm in the informatics department, which is different than computer science, and different universities pair those differently. However, I will have computer science students come over from that department that have been learning Java or some other language and they want to get into web dev because that's not necessarily web dev. So I'm talking about a, a web dev crash course here, not just a computer science crash course by any means. So there is a separation. Uh, but the first thing you want to learn, HTML. That is the foundation. And then often I find people rush through HTML because they think it's simple. But what I emphasized in the course that I shared with Free Code Camp that you can also find on my channel is to understand those foundations and the semantic elements to not just throw divs everywhere, but build a website that's based on logic with those semantic elements. It's going to help everything else. It's like building a house. If you lay that foundation first, everything else is stronger. And that includes accessibility, uh, screen readers. They, they understand those semantic elements better. So if you start with HTML and understand that well, then you can move on to CSS. And that's the second part of your house. That's where the frame is up, the foundation's there. Now we wanna make it look nice. And so we're painting the walls, we're adding carpet, we're doing all the things that make it a nice house for us to live in at that point and look at. But the only reason it continues to stay standing and holds together well is because we've built that great foundation of HTML first. But then somewhere along the way, and this can happen at the same time because they sometimes work together, you also need JavaScript. Now my, my analogy for the house with JavaScript is that's when you add plumbing, air conditioning, the things that make the house interactive. You can change the temperature in the house. You can of course have hot and cold water and different things you interact with that make your house more useful. That's the JavaScript that you add, but all three of those are what we call 
the pillars of the web. Those are the foundational three. Now, the first class we teach the foundations of web at the university, that's HTML and CSS. JavaScript is complex enough that we save that for a separate class. And we teach that over 16 weeks. And that is front end web development one. That's so those are the, the pillars there. That is your foundation when you're first starting out your first year, even beyond that, if you focus on nothing other than those three things, that is a great start in web development. I think that's a, that's a great take. I always say that the fundamentals are fundamental and old. I never heard someone says like, oh my God, like I spent so much time on fundamentals, like I wasted <laughs> my time. It's always the opposite. If you think about this and say, oh no, I, no but I'm trying Nest.js is cool, but I can't understand uh, why, why it's working. And, and I mean, there are different uh, philosophies, I would say approaches. I think that uh, I am with you with this, uh, and I think that uh, the time you spent, like, because you know, it's full of videos. I say, like, I'll teach you JavaScript in 30 minutes. Yeah, in 30 minutes, you, you can watch a video maybe on JavaScript. Maybe if you are fast at typing, you can, in one hour, you can understand some concepts. But uh, I think that it's close to, like, I don't know, learning how to play guitar or piano. It takes some time because you need to give uh, our brain the time to assimilate this concept they are they seem easy the first time you say okay so this is just a div this is just that's it but then when you need to build with your own with your own uh, uh, IDE with, with the empty uh, the empty IDE it's not that easy anymore and uh, in that case if you know exactly what everything does this is where you'll save time and then I think you also understand uh, because you see Dave didn't mention a single framework you're mentioning just concepts because you tomorrow will have a new framework the new shiny javascript framework 2024 and we'll make a video about this of course but if you are a beginner you understand okay so this framework does this okay nice but you need to understand that these are the the basics and i'll keep i'll die on this hill probably that you, <laughs> that this time is always spent well really trying to learn in the the fundamentals. I will be uh, on that hill with you, Francesco. <laughs> nice. We will be together on that hill. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. So, uh, let's take a couple of questions. And this is getting super excited. Super excited. By the way, there is uh, this one minute video by Dave. It's get, I want this video to reach 100k views uh, as soon as possible. I, sh I share the link. We're getting to 90k already. So come on, go and check it out. It's just one minute. Save it. Uh, Madhu is asking how broad is web development and what thing and technologies are required at least to become a good web developer this is uh, really hard wow uh, web development is very broad that, matter of fact that's one of the things i tell beginners is there's no way you can know it all you you just won't you, you can't learn it all and i look up things all the time too all the time so mdn i'm on that website all of the time I've used many of the things, but I don't necessarily remember all of the things either. And I can't just think about web development all the time. I've got teenagers. I've, I've got life that's getting in the way. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not always thinking about that. So it, it doesn't hurt to have to look up that. How do you split a string? You know, how, how can I get the username out of this email address again? If you don't remember how to do that, you know, in five minutes, or or instantly even just just look it up there's nothing against that and for my students even at the university i always say hey this is open book when i give quizzes or assign a project there, there's never a time that my employer would say i want you to solve this problem for the company but you can't use any resources make the best thing you can but don't look at anything that, that doesn't make any sense so all of those resources are there you should always use all of the resources available to you and you can't remember everything. So it's very broad. Now, again, the, the foundations there, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, as you said, those aren't frameworks. Those, those are foundations. Those are the basics. We're going to build, you know, how many JavaScript frameworks? Things change quickly. Things change in five years. What we were doing is not the same as, you know, what we're currently doing. And so, 
there, you just want to have those foundations in place to learn the next new thing. And as you learn more things, you start to understand, okay, I see what they're doing here. I see this state pattern. I see this design pattern. You, you won't know those as beginners, but as you continue to work with it, you will. So it, there's so many broad things out there. You just want to start understanding concepts. So um, I guess Next.js is a very popular framework. So I'll, I'll just quickly mention that. I'm giving a talk on that, by the way, at that conference here at the end of the month in uh, Austin, Texas. So I'm a little nervous, Francisco. You've done this many times, but this will be my first conference talk. So I, I'm, yes. I'm used to talking to you know, know classrooms of students and talking on campus. This will be a little different, I think. Yes. Uh, so, so if this will be your first uh, one, I can give a super, super quick tip that worked for me. So I, I can take 30 seconds just for this. So I was used to do like videos on YouTube. So when I jumped on stage, so this is, it seems like uh, counterintuitive, like super unpopular, but usually on stage, they are recording the event. So if you don't know what to do, Basically, I was just looking at the camera and pretending that I was like alone recording a video. And this worked <laughs> well because it felt more comfortable. It's crazy, because, but uh, yeah, I felt more comfortable in uh, seeing, okay, so there is a camera, so I can pretend that yeah, I'm recording a video. But there are some people here watching. So this, I don't know, this calmed me down on the first uh, one, two talks. I don't know if this trick will work. <laughs> in case, let me know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure you will need it. It's uh, Speaking, it's very similar to running exercising like the first three minutes you, if you don't know you tend to like go out of breath after the first three minutes i'm sure that you you will you will nail it down it's absolutely great nice nice we can make a, maybe a space or an event where we can discuss this but i'm sure you don't need it oh well thank you for nice. the uh, <laughs> the tip and the vote of confidence there <laughs> let's see so as I was saying with Next.js, uh, that being a framework, there's a lot of concepts there. And I a lot of the confusion I see around it are because of confusion about those concepts, not necessarily how do I write the syntax in Next.js, for example. They just don't understand what the concept is doing exactly. And there's lots of caching involved in Next.js. So, I learned a lot about caching when I was creating uh, progressive web apps there that that were trending, you know, five or six years ago. Not that progressive web apps aren't still good, but there's a lot of caching involved. I think that's one of the best ways to learn caching. And so then when you start talking about CDNs and okay, the, the server is going to cache this and the browser is going to cache that, and it starts to all get confusing there. That's that's just one example of where a lot of concepts have come together. And uh, if you understand those from from other foundational things, it, it all pulls together a little easier. Yes, and this also helps us to understand that uh, frameworks are not black sorcery, but they are using some concepts that have been around for a while. Maybe they were not like embedded inside the framework, so they made this extra work. This is why it's a framework, but they're not like inventing something that was absolutely not here <laughs> for authentic here we have a question related to Next.js. so i'm taking this question by yash what does what, what do you think on an app based app based writing and routing in Next.js? and how does production grade application comes at a decision to choose app versus page based routing Okay, let me break all of this down here again. So I'm, I'm going to go back over this. First, what do I think on uh, using the app router in Next.js? Uh, I really like the app router. Uh, that's my first initial thought. I like that. But oh, I missed, there's the question again. And uh, production grade application comes at a decision to choose the app versus pages. So I didn't really, I'm not an early ad adopter, by the way, in anything. I always take my time. There's so many things coming out in web dev. I, I kind of wait to see if something takes hold a little bit. And I started getting a lot of requests to create tutorials about Next.js after the new React docs came out last March. And that's because those new React docs, uh, react.dev, uh, recommend using a framework. They they deprecated Create React app, said, uh, hey, don't, don't use this by itself anymore. We suggest using a framework. And the very first one they listed was Next.js. It's not the only one, but it's the first one. So I started getting lots of requests 
for tutorials and how do I use that? Because I was creating a lot of React content before that. Um, so I dove in right around uh, Next.js 13.1 or so. I mean, that was right when the app router was new. So it's hard for me to compare to pages other than some of the uh, content that I've seen that was already out there because I didn't really use uh, the pages construct in Next.js. I just kind of dove into the app router. Uh, the choice about using any framework, not just Next.js, is does it make your life a little easier? Does it abstract some things uh, from what I would have to create individually myself uh, when, when you choose that? And there's things that Next.js does that, that I really like. And this comes from my background in e-commerce there from that first dot boom 20 some years ago now, where we were really concerned about SEO and page ranking. And we wanted to be found and deliver static content to Google, which was really taking off at the time. I don't know if, if uh, how far you would go back with this, Francisco, but if you remember before Google was the top dog, it was Yahoo. And Yahoo was not a search engine. It was a search directory. And so you would see names in that directory like triple A sporting or, you know, I'm just making a, up a name here, but they would all start with three A's and things like that to try to be listed at the top. Um, but once Google took hold, we wanted to be found and we did very well in search engine rankings. And that's because we delivered static content and knew how to deliver site maps and all of those things. And Next.js is really focused on this. There's a huge section of metadata that you can create and, and they have, have done a lot with the metadata and SEO and also social sharing as far as open graph images. And I've blogged about a lot of this on the blog I recently started, which you can find at davegray.codes. So not .com, but .codes. And I've got several articles there on creating metadata and those things with Next.js. So that's one of the things they focused on. If you are creating a website for e-commerce full of products, Next.js allows you to create static content pages, and then you can stream in those other sections that need that interactivity. You're pushing your client components, more of your traditional client side React JS to what they call the leaves. You're pushing that out, but you're creating a lot of static content that can get delivered right away. So there is some necessity there, but it's understanding the reason behind that. Now in, in the videos that I created on that uh, next JS series I did, we worked with a blog and the final project was a blog, but that's always a good project for creating static content. So I'm pulling in and I do this on my blog, by the way, too. I'm pulling in MDX files from a GitHub repo, and then Next.js is generating that static content from it. But you could use a CMS content management system. You could use like Sanity IO, or you could pull it in from some other database. There's no preference there, but it's what Next.js does generate for you. And that is static content that delivers something that can be uh, crawled by the search engines, that can be shared on social media, all of those things. And of course, create an actual website, not a single page application where you have to do workarounds then to make it appear static. And that doesn't always work out as good as you want it to. That was amazing. It was basically a crash course uh, in uh, <laughs> live. Like, so it was great. Uh, they were really, oh, thanks. Really, really amazing. I'll be I talking a lot more about this at that, that conference talk. I, uh, nice. uh, some, some of the reason that I really like JS, it, uh, Next JS is my background because I knew how important that static content was. And I love working with React and single page applications as a developer. But that, that single div with the ID of root, you know, that... Uh, that always scared me. I thought, what does the search engine see? What, what is, you know, and there are some workarounds for that, but, but it's still, you're delivering in basically an empty uh, HTML page. And then this big avalanche of JavaScript gets sent to it <laughs> after afterwards. So yeah. that was always a concern when, when I had that thought before about how, how does this really work with the search engine or, as far as anything that needs static content, you know? So there is a difference and I see the reasoning behind why something like Next.js was created. Yes, yes, I agree. I also had the same concern. I think that I tried Angular, I don't know, it was seven, eight years ago. 
And yes, I had also this concern, like, okay, this looks great, but what, like, uh, if this goes, uh, like, in production? Because, uh, you know, if, if if when we want to build our first project, we, we don't even know what our production environment is. We just wanted to build the thing. Yeah, I guess that's it. But it's, uh, in that case, yes, there are some workarounds, but uh, you're basically solving a problem that you didn't have before. So, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> that is true. We created this problem for ourselves, and now we need to solve it. <laughs> exactly. I want to take this question because it's also a question that uh, I think I, I'm interested in. And sometimes I get this also on the channel when I make uh, some examples. For example, some on some. For example, I made a video which was like a Next.js uh, as a front end in quotes, uh, Express, and then everything Dockerized connected to a Postgres database. So someone's like, "Hey, why are you doing this?" So let, let, let's read this. So. What's your take on using SJS with a separate backend server, let's say Express or any other backend servers? Why it is this so hard to do so? I don't know if it is hard, but like, uh, what, what, what what's your take on using NextJS as a front-end framework? Because I think this is the question, I think. Oh, I, I think that's okay. Um, and now, of course, it's a full-stack framework, and, and that won't change, but it provides some things that we had to create before. So I, I remember a, a couple of years ago, uh, one of my early tutorials on my channel using Node.js was how to create an API key relay because everybody was asking, how do I hide my API key? Well, you had that in an environment variable, but your code's all on the front end. It eventually had to get injected into the code and then somebody could open the source code and see that API key. So we created a Node.js you know, a server and eventually a, a serverless function even could do this, but it was running in Node.js where you would pull in that environment variable on that server or in that serverless function in Node.js. So you'd make a request from the client, which would then hit that server or serverless function that would use your API key to send a request then to the actual third party API. And that's why we called it a relay. It was like the race where they hand off the baton there. So you'd make the request, it would go to that intermediary Node.js function or server that then would pull in the hidden API key so it didn't have to be in your client code. Then it would go to the third party, give the correct API key, get say the weather data or whatever it is, send it back and then eventually send it back to the client. So you just created that in between. Well, you can do that with Next.js without creating something separate. You just do that in a server component. So you keep your API key on the server. And then if you're getting weather from a third party weather API, uh, then you can of course send that request there and then get it back. And you could create your own separate REST API and Node.js or, or whatever you, you wanted to create. And Next.js can interact with that just as it would a third party API. So I don't think it's difficult. I think it's a separate, uh, I think it's a changing of the mindset, really, and, and that's what we're doing here. We're realizing we have access to a back end that we don't have to issue requests the way we would have with a SPA, you know, your single page React application that would have had to issue a request in a different way. Now we can just take advantage of having access to server components right there in, in our Next.js code. Yeah, this is a great answer. I can add the fact that usually when you join a company, they don't start from scratch. It's not your your weekend side project. So maybe we already have a Node.js backend API and they just want to use something cool for the front end or the opposite. You start using Next.js, but they don't know how to store data. And there is one, they decide to use Next.js. So sometimes it's not just... Uh, you would because if you're alone at home it's saturday night uh, it's rainy you say okay let's start a new project let's just use nsjs a full stack up uh, all oh, everything in typescript use use even trpc you are happy and you do sometimes for companies it, it's not like this they have pieces they have uh, something they have an interface maybe for the authentication they have four databases because uh, reasons that they don't want to change so this is this is i think that why we should uh, know everything and all the concepts uh, and then adapt sometimes it's not just uh, a single person decision we wish and i was i know because i've been working for the european space agency 
everything was complicated. Even even upgra- upgrading, updated the npm version. Everything was complicated. We need the sign of someone. It was uh, like it's like this, like working for comp- corporates. Nice. Um, That's a very good point. We're we're learning all of these new cool things that we like to uh, experiment with and learn about. But you get a job working for a company and you inherit legacy code. <laughs> you're you're going to yeah. be working with something that's. Yeah, that's maybe not the newest iteration or, you know, it, it, it's just not getting changed out. I, I inherited a code base that was, that I don't like. It, it's all cold fusion. I had to learn about cold fusion. I knew other concepts. I hadn't worked with cold fusion before. I don't want to work with cold yeah. fusion again, <laughs> but, yeah, but I mean, it's there. That's it. Yeah, but we, we, sometimes we get to make a decision like in five minutes. We say, okay, I don't like this, but maybe, you know, the jobs they evolve but it's not like i mean in tech the things sometimes they move faster but maybe not in a single one i like this one by a claris how are you in your opinion i think this is important how what, what does it take to become a senior web developer i think i don't know someone invented this word so basically we can they can pay someone less so this is my my opinion but uh, in your what do you think is worth uh, can you can really focus to become a senior web developer so it's basically this is asking basically i don't know the end basically of the roadmap but let's say if you really want to level up well uh, as far as coding education i my advice is to try to learn a little something more every day uh, and and understand those concepts so like i said when you start working with another code base uh you you know the concepts, even if you're not as familiar. Like I said, I wasn't familiar with Cold Fusion before I had to uh, start working with that project. So that's something you can do, and that experience continues to help you grow. Now that's the education part of it. Now let's let's be honest. In in life, you need to network. You need to have some skills that are not just coding. If you if that's your pursuit, if you want to continue to get promoted and level up and Maybe you're eventually going to get promoted to where you have more meetings than writing code. And do you want that? You know, there's there's that honest uh, question there as well. Because uh, getting promoted to a senior level or any type of promotion at work could involve more than just knowing how to code. Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. We see. We see many more questions, and yes, uh, so sounds fair, but even in this, as a front end, a lot of pros. Integrating legacy projects with the next, yes, yes, I think that uh, starting with the front end is good, and maybe, I don't know, probably at some point you can even start, I don't know, having some API in Next.js, and you still use the old service, and then at some point, uh, someone will wake up and say, okay, now let's do this. Uh, migration all these uh, these and good luck mm-hmm. with that in that case hey that that brings up a point i should highlight too because i've had beginner questions about this so just as we're talking about nextjs now nextjs has route handlers but they should really just be viewed as server components there's no reason to send a request to a route handler that can be issued from your server component you don't that would be creating a relay in itself and you don't need to do that there's no need to add an additional request in there that's that's only going to bog things down just a little bit you you request that data directly from the server component you don't relay through a route handler which is just another server component and that that's been that's a thought process again that starts with react because with react we always had to send a request to an endpoint that that was always happening in the single page application that is not necessarily the case with nextjs i agree so david i don't know if this is possible but we already are at, are at four, 45 minutes so wow. i think we we need to go <laughs> time is really really flying for real I'm so enjoying want, the talk, I guess. Uh, yeah, thank you. Ben. Ab- abs- absolutely. <laughs> I want to try to, to um, get as many questions as possible, and then we want to wrap up. I think okay. you're really sharing really some great lights. But maybe before going with the questions, is there anything else that you want to add maybe in your web development roadmap, or did you say anything? Ever? Well, in the roadmap there, I would say after the foundations, you know, your three pillars of the web that I said, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. After that, 
learn some about the back end as well. And that's the other thing we teach, you know, the following semester, usually in the fall, I'm teaching your front end web development, which is introducing students to JavaScript. And in the spring, so this just started for me here, I'm teaching the basics of back end web development. So start to understand everything about the API on the back end, you know, uh, the status codes that, that are sent back when you send a request from your front end, uh, learn, everything about that cores that's that's an area that confuses beginners learn, learn all the basics build a few rest apis of your own so so that starts to give you the full stack understanding but it's even going to help you if you just decide in the future you want to focus on front end because you need to understand how that back end will respond and those status codes you receive as well so that would be the next thing i would put in the fundamentals now i would add too that I've kind of grouped my YouTube courses that I've created into a order or a pattern, if you will. And you can find that at, I believe it's courses.davegray.codes, or if you just go to davegray.codes and then there's a little graduation cap icon that it would take you there. And that's, it's a free organizational roadmap that I have put together. So you can just kind of go through in the order that I would recommend learning those things. So, so that would also help out because there's other things along the way that I list as optional. You know, do you need to learn Redux after you've learned React? Not necessarily. And some would argue that there's less of a need to now more than ever. However, if you want to learn more about, say, client side state management, then maybe it's a good thing to learn at the same time. So there are things I would consider optional. And I always tell everyone when they ask me what I should learn next, I say, what are you interested in? Because you need to stay motivated. And that interest is going to keep you motivated. I agree. And I think it's always a compromise in what we need at work and what we want to learn. So I don't know, if they want to implement Redux at work, you need to know a bit more and what you need. And then you study on your own. It's always like compromise on these two things. I hope I, I put the right link here, courses.degree.codes. Uh, I think and, that's right. Uh, I, think, I think that's it. Uh, nice, nice. Um, I agree with this. Uh, I'm really focused on the REST uh, API thing. Uh, I've done this with many different technologies. Uh, and um, I think it's fascinating even trying to, to understand and grasp it. At the end, it's always the same concept uh, using different languages and different technologies. Now, we have one question about DSA. I promise that I'll make a, a DSA cor course when I'll reach 100K. And now I'm, I'm scared because now it's getting <laughs> super fast. No, jokes, joking, I have a CS degree. I love this topic, but uh, it can become a thing. But uh, uh, let's take this, uh, this question. Let's say, what do you think it's like? Uh, how much is it important? Do you have any videos on this? And uh, I, I do, do you not. Think it's important? Yeah, I, I have not created any videos on this, and, and maybe that shows how important I think it is. I mean, there's so much in web dev that, that is not, uh, you know, data structure and analysis. Although I do think it's important to, to a point for sure, because you, you, especially if you get into full stack, you, you want to learn how to create a database. So again, at university, we might have, I'm in the informatics department again. So we might have computer science students come over that have studied that more or less, but we do have a database course, you know, where, where we're at least learning the fundamentals and structure of creating tables and how a relational database should work. I think that would be the, the basics there that you should know. Now, of course, DSA is, is definitely more than just, you, you know, a database structure, but you, you want to learn how to solve problems. I, I think problem solving and, and tackling some of that, however you do it, is important. But I have not dedicated a course uh, nor taught a course that was dedicated to DSA at the university level. Yes, and I think, uh, for example, for me, I made these DSA courses. I spent a whole summer creating a, a, a relational database when I was in my freshman year. I don't know. I think in a span of a life, it can be useful. I think, I think some people even, they have this. Uh, so some people might be interested because we need they need to pass an exam. So I think that most of the people, it's because of this at first. They mm -hmm. want a DSA video because they want to pass the exam, the exam and then interview. But uh, I honestly think that interviews are a bit broken in tech, yeah. but uh, it, it is what it is. And I say this from 
from a, uh, the perspective of someone who has uh, this degree. Um, man and stuck. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, oh, oh I was just going to oh, add to that that, uh, you know, it depends on the company that you want to work for. If you're targeting a company and you know in their interview process that they, they emphasize DSA, maybe you want to learn that more. But I, I think in, in the general job market, I think networking will help you more than learning one specific skill like that too. <clears throat> I agree. I agree with this. I think that everything can count. And uh, I don't think that, I mean, think that if you have some extra time, it's nice. It's not really at the core. This is also why I never made, like, even if I made the DSA exams, I never created DSA videos so far because I think there is something which is more important. And maybe, I don't know. I'll try. I'll try. I will see. Um, Mern Stack. Do you agree that the Mern Stack is not enough for a junior role? Okay, I thought that the Mernasak was not like that basic. Like I was told to add up C Sharp and Java. I, I think there are many technologies. I don't know. <laughs> what yeah, do you I think? I mean, it, it depends on the company too. Uh, you could uh, be talking to a, a role or a company about a role and, and Mern has been maybe their focus for the last several years. So in that case, it would be enough. And, and there could be another company that, that says, what is MERN? They may not even know or they haven't worked with it. So uh, that's really kind of a, a, a general question there. But learning the things the MERN stack can teach you, which I did create a series on that, I think that's good. I mean, we're talking Mongo and then Node and Express and React is what makes up the MERN stack. And not in that order as far as the acronym goes, but in the order that I would think of it. And uh, yeah, that can teach you a lot of skills by by learning the MERN stack and again concepts. So that's a NoSQL database that would give you, uh, you know, skills with NoSQL. That would teach you about creating a REST API with Node and Express, and then of course about teaching the or about learning the front end with React. Nice, uh, nice, nice, uh, perfect. In my, in my opinion, I think it's like learning two additional languages just to get a junior role. I don't know if it can be a bit too much. I will focus more on yeah. few, few technologies. I remember when I was uh, tr trying to look for my first role, I had like many, many languages. Now I have like four, three, three things because it basically I'm <laughs> I'm focused on more things. Uh, I, I don't, I think that focusing more can, it depends, it depends on what uh, are I currently working for. Uh, we, okay. Okay, nice. I think we can get this very last question, this one technical, and then we wrap up, uh, Dave, our first uh, collaboration. Super excited. Thank you, of course, uh, for coming. Oh, thank you. I've been using JavaScript for almost two years. Nice. I want to begin le learning Python, but don't want to use it for web development. Okay. What's your advice? Is JavaScript enough for web dev? Uh, yeah, JavaScript is enough for web dev. You, you not necessarily need to learn Python for web dev. You can if you want to. I, I enjoy Python. Uh, JavaScript's kind of my primary focus, but I really like using Python, and I have used it in some courses I even took as a graduate student because it gets into data. You can get into other areas, you know, your machine learning, data analysis, uh, you can do web scraping with Python. However, there's some things you can do with Python you can also choose to do with Node. And I've noticed even with Langchain, if you're getting into uh, large language models now, you could use Node.js with that or Python, either one. They've got docs for both. So uh, I would say Python, if you want to go ahead and get into more than just web dev. But if you just want to do web dev, there's nothing wrong with just focusing on JavaScript. Yes, I, I've used the Python more than what Twitter thinks because I started making some jokes that JavaScript is better than Python. So people now think that I hate Python. I've used the Python professionally for downloading data from satellites when I was working for the OBS Space Agency, like for example, for web scraping, analyzing the uh, analyzing uh, data, a web page. I think Python is uh, is great uh, for this. And so, so yes, but I think that. Uh, you can absolutely use Python, not for web development. I can understand, like say, okay, for web development, I just use JavaScript is way more than enough, I think. And then maybe you want to learn Python, I don't know, for some data science or machine or learning. Maybe you I really agree. like Python and you want to use it for web dev. And if you want to, you certainly can. I'm doing a, a Django series on my channel right now and it, it's very enjoyable. Same. 
see so maybe it's a good idea to just give it a try just checking the dave's uh, youtube channel nice um okay dave i don't want to cross the one hour line so i would like to give you the opportunity maybe to leave a final message uh, for someone over here we have uh, um, about 40 people some of them probably came here because they want to know more about the process on how they can learn web development in 2024. What can we tell uh, to them? We are already half month in 2024, so yeah. Well, go easy on yourself. This is this is my advice. Uh, you, you don't need to know everything the first week you start learning web development. Don't put expectations on yourself that make you feel bad. Just learn a little something new every day. The power of positivity here. Also the power of consistency. And, and you'll see that from Francisco here who has, has built up his following on different platforms and continues to do very well. He's very consistent. The only reason that my YouTube channel has continued to grow is because I consistently publish to that. But that's the thing about learning as well. So you want to be consistent in your learning. You don't want to burn out. You don't want to try to do too much too fast or put those expectations on yourself that cause you to feel bad about yourself. Just my advice is always learn a little something new every day. And it's okay to take the weekend off too, but just learn a little something new every day during the week and you will be fine. Continue making progress, consistency. I love this one, Dave. I think I, I needed uh, also these uh, tips uh, maybe five, uh, ten years ago when I started coding because I can go passionate uh, easily. And let's say I decided to then go on more this consistent and day-to-day -day learning. And I think that's it's because uh, there is an, a fixed amount of things we can learn in a single day. I don't know if you ever tried to, know, to, to, to just prepare an exam in two days. It's impossible, even if you stop sleeping, because our brain at some point is like, it's enough for today. It's like <laughs> right. our body. It, the problem is that if, you, if we go for a run, if you exercise, after two hours, our body is like, Francesco, stop, stop. I'm just uh, fainting. Our brain, it's harder because you can get an extra coffee, you get an uh, uh, energy drink, and you keep going. But then your body is consuming because uh, you, you, you can, you're, basically you are, maybe you are staring at the screen, but you're not... Uh, learning it's way better to go to sleep in that case nice nice dave really really enjoyed this uh, drop uh, drop some uh, some buys and compliments uh, in the chat i didn't highlight them all because there were too many great session of course uh, and thank you uh, dave really best of luck for 2024 i want you to reach 1 million subscribers super so soon this year max uh, next year i'll give you a couple of more years <laughs> but i really want to <laughs> and i think that you are doing a really really great job i discovered your channel just lately but uh, you're doing amazing things you started in 2020 so during the pandemic you are literally been uh, crushing with educational content and uh, yes i'm happy that and finally we had time to make this uh, collaboration it has been a while but I say okay now i need to you know send a dm to dave so say in 2023 as in december say, okay now i need to reach out to these two three people we have jack harry jack harrington next week oh that's great that, yeah I like yeah, there are a, yeah there are a couple of people that say okay like i have them like on my on my list that i want to reach out but uh, finally i'm happy dave um, and thank you thank you so much uh, well, everyone hey i'm honored thank yeah. you for having me and uh I'm looking forward to traveling and uh, and meeting people. And someday I want to uh, come to where you are and we can share that coffee. And uh, I, I love coffee, as I think others know. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Okay. I'm from Italy. I'm from Rome. So we are recording this. When you'll come to Italy, you have a free pizza and free coffee. Free coffee. Oh, this is thank our you record. so much. <laughs> so you, can, you can save this part of this video. <laughs> saying all okay. the best things. Thank you. I, I'm looking <laughs> nice. forward to it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, too. I, I sincerely appreciate all the support and positivity, and I hope you have a great 2024. Let's all stay in touch. Nice, nice, amazing. Thank you so much, and bye, everyone. See you next week with Jack Harrington, and thank you so much again, Dave. We have all the links in the description, of course. Uh, let's get him to 1 million. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.